Good morning and welcome to Ogemaw Hills Church. Good it's good to be gathered together in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. God is good. Sometimes it's good to remind ourselves that God's having a good day today. And I can, I can join him in that day, right? God's having a good day today. And so uh, we praise the Lord, the one who's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Uh, we're going to celebrate communion at the tail end of the service today. So if you'd make sure you have access to uh, prepackaged uh, juice and wafer, that would be great. They are in uh, underneath the seats on the racks in front of you. If you have a seat in front of you, if you don't have a seat in front of you, they're between the seats. Um, so please just make sure there's one for everybody who would like to participate in communion. If you don't have one right there, they are various places and you can go and steal one. Just please don't take it from someone's hand. Um, that would just be bad. Uh, but we're glad to get joined together in the name of our Lord, look into his word, worship him in spirit and truth today, come to his table and remember him as we drink of the bread, or eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Just to run through some of our uh, normal housekeeping, uh, the bulletin packets you'll find in seat backs in front of you or underneath your seat, depending on where you're sitting in the uh, sanctuary, and you'll find connect cards, offering envelopes, uh, pens, everything you need, so please uh, feel free to use those materials and you can leave those materials on the seats when you are finished after service, anything you don't want to take with you. Um, the Connect cards are precious to us. We love to use those as a point of uh, connection, information update, feedback, and prayer. And so if you have a prayer request you'd like people praying with you about, uh, please fill that out. You can drop it in either of the black offering stations on your way out. If you have an offering you'd like to give to worship the Lord, uh, that is always wonderful as well. And thank you for your faithfulness. I'd like to take a moment and just touch on a few things in the bulletin because this week is another shift in the church schedule, um, which we're so thankful for. Uh, this week, our midweek ministries kick off, and so we have midweek children's ministry for nursery through CLC, our elementary school age, our 56 club for fifth and sixth graders. That will all be here in this building. And then at our south campus down South Bray Road, we have our student center where seventh through 12th will meet. And in the sanctuary, we will have adults something available for the adults. And so everything's kicking off this coming Wednesday, 6 till 7.15. If you'd uh, like to participate in ministry as an adult, what we're going to start with uh, to launch this new season of ministry uh, is have uh, participation in our uh, church family's national prayer summit. Uh, we're going to be uh, streaming that and watching that online and participating that way. And so we'll be doing prayer to kick things off here in the sanctuary. So again, that's this Wednesday at 6 p.m., so be praying for our leaders, our workers, the volunteers, as they get geared up to have kids flood this place and somehow manage the chaos to the glory of our God. So be praying uh, for that. And we're always thankful for the opportunity to show the love of Jesus to the next generation. 
Uh, we are right at the beginning of uh, the 10 days of prayer and fasting that our church is participating in. Uh, we are connecting with the national and worldwide call to the return, uh, with the culmination uh, being at the tail end of the 10 days. We're doing a 10-day time of prayer and repentance. We have prayer guides available uh, for the 10 days, just a little devotional, a little uh, food for prayer, and a little um, reflection through the scripture. And so please feel free to grab one of those if you'd like a uh, handheld physical copy of that. They are at the main welcome desk out here in the main lobby. Uh, when you walk out, feel free to grab one and really encourage every person to be praying in a special way. Um, pray and consider how you could be fasting, whether that's a 10-day uh, fast from food or maybe the Lord would lead you in other directions and other ways to fast of uh, things to lay down. And part of fasting also we see in Isaiah 58 is we lay things down and we take things up. Right? We lay things down that we could fill up those empty places in our lives in special ways to press into the presence of God. And we as a nation, we, we need to repent. Right? And we can repent e even, even on behalf of groups that we're a part of. You know, uh, like uh, if you're a Christ follower, we could repent on behalf of the church. You know, if the church has not been diligent to pray or be about the word or we start to preach a prosperity gospel that waters down or dilutes the true gospel, if we've been, as the Church of Jesus Christ in America, for the most part, if we've kept our faith to ourselves and not shared the love of Jesus Christ and the gospel of God and talked about sin and repentance to other people the way God has created us to, if there's some ways that we need to repent that way, we can repent on behalf of the church. As a citizen of this great country, we can repent on behalf of the nation, right? Even if you didn't directly participate in the sin, we see biblically that we can participate or we can uh, repent on sin that has to do with the groups that we're a part of. Uh, we can repent on behalf of our family. Uh, we can repent. And so um, be prayerful about that, that we would turn from these things that lead to destruction and turn wholeheartedly to our God and see him revive hearts in this nation, revive hearts in our churches, and turn things for his glory. Uh, we need him desperately. And that, and that goes beyond elections, right? This is not a call to prayer just because an election is coming. It goes beyond elections, right? It doesn't matter who's elected or not elected. If the people of God aren't following hard after God, then that election doesn't matter, right? Well, the church of Jesus Christ is the only hope for the world, right? We carry the gospel of Jesus Christ. He has designed it that way. And so by his grace, we step out to his glory. So again, we're just into our second day of 10 days of prayer and fasting. So please consider being a part of that. Uh, if you'd like a digital copy of the prayer and devotional guide, if that's a little easier for you on your phone or whatever, just go to our church Facebook page, or if you received the email uh, this last week, the week before, I don't remember when the church news newsletter went out, there's a link right in there that goes right into the prayer guide uh, under the section on the return, uh, so you can do that as well. And so please take advantage of that and use this as a time to press into God in a special, special way. Um, Something special we wanted to announce as well as these next two Sundays, on the 27th and the 4th, we have some guest speakers with us uh, on each Sunday. And our, our goal and our, our intention over these next two Sundays is to intentionally seek God on how we can connect people with Christ in a very disconnected world. Right? These last six months has been very disconnecting, and there's reasons for that, right? We know the reasons. Um, but it's been very disconnected. So while people are distancing and disconnecting, how do we bring Christ to them in strategic and effective ways? And so we have a, a speaker that is heavily involved in international ministry as well as ministry in the U.S., and we have a speaker that is right in the midst of Detroit leading people to Christ to plant churches. And so uh, those two Sundays we're going to hear intentionally from two guest speakers just thinking about, okay, Lord, how can you use us here in Ogemaw County to connect people with Christ in such a disconnected world? and uh, trust the Lord for that. Other announcements that need to be made this morning? Wristbands. Oh, thank you. Yep, wristbands. And I've got long sleeves on today, so it kind of hides the wristbands, but um, we're using the wristband method just to communicate boundaries to each other. And so just respect each other's boundaries, whether it's green, yellow, or red. What that enables us to do is worship Jesus Christ together without stepping on each other, right? There's enough stepping on each other going on out there, whether it's face-to-face -face or online and uh, we want to look to Jesus Christ together and respect one another and so please uh, check out the bracelet on somebody's wrist before you tackle them in the love of Jesus Christ um, because you might just get an uppercut at just the perfect time you know 
Um, and so uh, keep your distance and just respect other people as uh, you see what their boundaries are. And praise God for the ability to love people. That comes from Jesus and Jesus alone, right? We can, we can kind of force ourselves into certain modifications of behavior to try to communicate kindness to another person, but real love comes by God, the God who is love. And his spirit poured out among us, his love shed abroad in our hearts, and we can love other people. And man, what the world needs now is love, you know, real love. Now, real love also points to sin. So I'm not talking about, hey, I'm okay, you're okay, everything's okay, and, you know, whatever. Um, but real love that lays down my life for the sake of another, that lays down my life for the sake of making the way for Christ to touch that other person. And sometimes me laying down my life is the willingness to love you enough to have a difficult conversation with you, right? That I would have the love of God poured out in my heart so much that I love God with everything I am. So because I love him with everything I am, I'm not worried about what this person thinks of me. I will find a way to tell them about Jesus. I don't, I don't care how busy my schedule is by the love of God within me. I will find time to pray for them and intercede for them and do war for them in prayer and intercession that they may find Christ. You know, that, I would, that I would pray with that earnestness that... that Paul the Apostle through the ministry of the Holy Spirit would pray with that I would pray and seek God till Christ be formed in you. Right? That we would carry that burden and that brokenness within us through the true love of God. So the love of God goes way beyond the world just needing a smile on a face. That's something that bothers me a little bit about the masks too. Man, you can't see people smiling. You know, people do need something as practical as just a smile. Just know that there's somebody that's for them not against them because it feels like sometimes the world man everything's against you and so we do things like you know practical things like a smile but man it goes a whole lot deeper than that doesn't it you know that we offer christ out of love we lay down our lives out of love that god would heal in his love hallelujah well at this time i'd like to invite you to stand with me boy you know you're in for a great service when you get a sermon before anything starts right man pastors what are you going to do with them Let's pray and prepare our hearts to worship Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you for the privilege of worship. And Lord, we know this privilege has been purchased by your blood. Lord, through you walking victoriously, triumphantly out of that tomb, Lord, conquering death. That, Lord, that's made life and life abundant available to us. Lord, you've come that we would have life and life overflowing. And this morning, we want to experience that life in you as we offer ourselves to you as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing. So, Lord, we set our attention on you this morning. We, we don't allow anything to crowd in on us, God. We put our eyes on you, the eyes of our faith. And, Lord, we want to worship you with everything we are. Worship you in spirit and in truth. You are God, and there's no one like you. So, Lord, no matter what we carried into this place, with the, the burdens, the concerns, the worries, the brokenness, Lord, we lay it all at your feet this morning, and we trust you with it. So, God, have your way among us. We want to please you with the offering of ourselves this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's welcome the Lord in our worship and praise. Let's open up the heavens. Let's ask, let's request, let's petition. Lord, show us your glory. Two, three, four. <laughs>
of your people. Thank you, Lord. We've seen you in times of old. I've seen you, Lord, in my lifetime do signs and wonders and miracles. I've seen you move mountains. I've seen you move nations and people. We ask, Lord, Lord, move again. Move on behalf of your people. Move on behalf of this, this population. Just still enough. Keep 
promises of God are yea and amen to those that believe and they never fail. Even just mustard seed faith, tiny faith, you can speak to a mountain that is in your way, say, be gone, throw it in the midst of the sea. You could be walking through a trial or a valley of your own. And know that he says that when you go through this valley, you're never going to be by yourself. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I am not going to be fearful. Thank you, Lord. I search the world. Satisfied here in 
one who can. Lord, you're the only one who can. So we look to you, God, as the great I am, the one who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. We look to you, Lord, as the only one, the only hope, only, the only source of love, the only source of peace. Lord, you really are our all in all. We worship you now and forever. God, some of us, we've got, we've got some graves in our lives. We've got some dead places. And won't you bring beauty out of it? Bring new life out of it? Turn those graves into gardens. Lord, we, apart from you, we carry the shame of our sin, the shame of, of promoting self. God, it seems sometimes like this world just double downs on it, Lord. They, they try to glory in their own shamefulness. But Lord, you're the only one that can bring glory out of what would otherwise be shame. Only you, Jesus, through your cleansing, through your holiness, through making us righteous in your presence, through faith in Jesus Christ, your one and only Son. Lord, have your way. Have your way, Jesus. We trust you as the only one. The only one who can. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. All of us are facing things that he's the only one who can. And you might think, well, I don't have any personal circumstances that require God's and God's only to intervene. Well, tell that to your eternal soul, right? If for some reason you've been insulated from what the rest of the world's been facing, and things that are going on all around us, turn eyes inward to your eternal soul. There's only one who can save. There's only one who can heal. There's only one who can fill. He is the only one who can. We have a desperate need of our God. You know, when he gives beauty for ashes, he turns mourning into dancing. Only God can do that. Now, we will see in the scripture that God will very clearly call his people who are sometimes wrongly rejoicing to a time of weeping and mourning over sin. Right? We see that in God's word. And so we don't want to, we don't want to in any way make anything that we're celebrating this morning about us. God's going to give me, God's going to give me, God's going to give me, God's going to give me. Right? Because if we do not mourn over sin and grieve over that, that loss and that wretchedness and receive him in the beauty of repentance, right? Then we can't have the mourning turning to dancing. There's nothing to dance about. We can't have beauty come from ashes. He calls us to be covered in ashes and sackcloth. Right? This is a critical time for the church of Jesus Christ nationally and worldwide to rise up with a voice of repentance and heart cry before God. That we would not just put on some sort of external display, right? But that we would not, as Jesus would get after the Pharisees, don't just rent your garments. You know, they would tear their garments in his expression of, of grief and repentance before the Lord. He said, don't just rent your garments, rent your hearts, right? Let your hearts be torn in two with the burden of sin, yours and others, before the Lord. And in that burden for sin, go to the cross and find life and life abundant. Find that beauty for ashes and that, that joy for mourning, that dancing for mourning. He's the only one who can. You know, he makes, makes the sea into a highway, right? Exodus. We see God part the sea and make a highway for his people. Right? He, he turns bones into armies. Ezekiel, I think it's 30, 37, if I remember correctly. You know, those dry bones, and they were very, very dry. And God brings this revelation to Ezekiel, this image to Ezekiel, this vision of this army, these dry bones coming together and standing before the Lord. A great and mighty army before him as a picture of his people at that time, and I think a picture of his people as we come to him during this time. You see this beautiful, beautiful imagery of what God and God alone does in the lives of people. But the beauty of it is, you know, it doesn't say, you know, we didn't sing all that and say it's to the Harvard grad alone. 
right? We didn't sing all that and say it's to those with six figures and their savings alone. If that's you this morning, can you come and talk to me after the service? <laughs> you know, that, that's not the qualification for experiencing the triumph and glory of our God. The qualification is coming to the only one who does it, right? Coming to him on his terms. And it's available to experience him and, and interact with him and surrender to him and walk with him to his glory by faith. Right? By faith, birthed in us by his grace that he pours out and lavishes upon us. We thank the Lord for that. This morning we're going to spend some time looking at the God of the mountains and valleys. I'm going to look in 1 Kings chapter 20 if you want to track with me. Uh, 1 Kings chapter 20. We're going to walk right through that chapter, 43 verses, and just, just talk through as we see what the Lord is saying to us. Now, God is speaking of his move on behalf of his people, Israel, thousands of years ago in a specific context. And, and we see the king of, of Aram, of, of the Arameans, that was coming against the God's people, Israel. Uh, the king of Israel at that point was Ahab. Now, Ahab is a train wreck. Ahab is no model citizen. Ahab was no follower of God. Ahab was married to Jezebel. If you know Jezebel, there you have Ahab. Right? And so we see difficulties all around, but God showed himself strong on behalf of his people as God confronted his enemy, God's enemy. Right? We, we in our life, in our culture, we face the enemy of God. Now, as I talk about this morning, I'm not talking about person-to-person -person stuff, right? I'm talking about a higher plane than that. I'm talking about a, a spiritual battle, a spiritual enemy, that there is a spiritual enemy of God, a spiritual enemy of the things of God, a spiritual enemy of the things and the, the kingdom of God, and therefore a spiritual enemy of the things of God and the kingdom of God in you as a believer in God through faith in Jesus Christ. Now, most probably accurately, when we talk about this, this enemy's interaction with us, we sometimes should rightly target sin, self, and Satan, right? Three S's. Sometimes we face issues in our life and we want to say, you dirty devil! Get out of my life. But really, it's because I'm choosing to... Do you like my preacher voice there? But really, it's the fact that we are wholeheartedly resisting God. We're giving him the spiritual stiff arm and pushing him off, right? It's our will. It's self. We're exalting self and um, degrading Christ, right? Rather than living in submission to him and his lordship. So sometimes self is the issue. Sometimes it's a sin issue. Sometimes it's a flat-out Satan issue, you know? Uh, but those things very much intermingle. You know, self needs to be taken to the cross and die, right? Die to self that we could truly live in Christ. And so as we walk through this, uh, this scripture, looking at this enemy of God, right? A physical enemy of the, God, the people of God. God worked in a supernatural and spiritual way to fight this enemy, right? And bring victory and prove that he is the God of the mountains and the God of the valleys. And in the context, what God's saying is, because he kind of took a statement here by uh, the, the servants of the king of Aram and the Arameans. He kind of took it personally. You know, if you could say that about God, not in a self-centered or sinful way, the way we would be if we took something personally like this, but he is the center of everything, right? Remember, God, we can't always attach our stuff to God because if, if I said, worship me, it would be blasphemy and idolatry. If God says, worship me, he is absolutely perfect in his statement, right? And so God being the center of everything and in Almost taking something personally is very um, appropriate for God. Because the Arameans are going to see in the scripture here a little bit in the story. They said, well, you know what? The, the, the people of God, the Israelites, their God must be the God of the mountains, the God of the hills. And that's why they whooped up on us. Let's go ahead and, and get our army back together and go back and fight them in the valley, in the plain. Because they, their God is the God of the mountains. But we're going to overpower them in the plain, in the valley. And God says, no, no, no. I'm the God of the mountain, and I'm the God of the valley. And what's God saying? I'm God everywhere. I am God always. Everything will bow the knee to me. There is no exception to my lordship. There is nowhere someone can go and escape my sovereignty. Right? He is God Almighty with whom we have to do. The one we will stand before and give an account with, for the deeds done in the body, whether good or bad. Right? He is God. And so the, the message we're going to take in this is, okay, you know, anybody experience any valleys in the last six months in the United States of America, right? There's, there's some ugly stuff going on, right? I mean, some 
ugly stuff. Some of it, in a sense, unavoidable. Some of it, an absolute despicable display of sin. Hideous, right? Where it used to be the devil tried to hide and be sneaky, right? That day's past. He's not trying to hide, you know, uh, right, in, right in our faces, right, all the time. And what we want to see is that, okay, we can have these, these mountains, right? We can have this, this context where, man, things are going well and the blessing of God's everywhere. And, man, the worship team was pounding on a Sunday morning and everything feels good. And then we walk back out into the real world, right? But we have this, this mountain where, man, God's here and, and God's victorious. And sometimes we'll find ourselves in a valley. Now, there can be reasons for the valley, right? But sometimes we'll find ourselves in a valley and we can have this temptation to our flesh, to ourself, to our sin nature that says God is not here the same as God was there, right? God is not ruler here the same as God was ruler there. And we want to be very careful about that, right? Because he is the God of the mountain. He's the God of the valley. And for us to somehow say, well, there he's victorious, here he's defeated, that's a personal affront to who God is eternally, right? God is the victor. And we as his, his children get to enjoy the fruits of his victory as we walk with him in faith and surrender, as we walk with him in obedience. So this morning, I'm just talk through this a little bit out of 1 Kings chapter 20. And just look at some of the, the tricks of the enemy. And remember, enemy, sin, self, Satan, right? The enemy is that which stands against the knowledge of God through the gospel of Jesus Christ, right? The enemy is that which stands in opposition to God and who he is in his work and will being accomplished among people. 1 Kings chapter 20, verse 1. Now Ben-Hadad, king of Aram, gathered all his army, and there were 32 kings with him and horses and chariots, and he went up and besieged Samaria and fought against it. Samaria being uh, the capital of the southern kingdom of Israel uh, and God's people. And a lot of history to get in there, but I won't belabor that. So Ben-Hadad, king of Aram, king over the Arameans, and 32 kings who were with him. 32 kings who were with him gathered up their horses, chariots, armies, and went to lay siege on God's people in Samaria. First thing I want to take note of is in this life, the enemy can seem overwhelming. If you spend any time wrongly fixating on the news of what's going around, going on around in our country, it's overwhelming. Right? If we look at the pain in our personal lives through the wrong lens and fixate upon it in a way that relies upon our strength or ability to accomplish some sort of victory or change, it is absolutely overwhelming. Sometimes when we just step back and objectively look at our lives and the habitual sin patterns that never, ever seem to change, it can be absolutely overwhelming. And the enemy can seem that way, right? Overpowering, outnumbering overwhelming. When we see God work in miraculous ways, we've seen very intentional times where God, on purpose, uses a, a body so weak that he has to get the glory, right? He uses a group, a, a number of his people that are so small to overcome an overwhelming enemy that he gets the glory, right? That's God's intention. Well, man, you and I can say, hallelujah, have at it, Lord, right? The enemy is overwhelming, right? The enemy of God's move and God's work is overwhelming. Lord, I, in my weakness, in my frailty, in my, the singleness of who I am or the, 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 the smallness of our numbers as, as true Christ followers, Lord, we could never do anything to change anything. And God says, there you go, right? You trust me and I will bring victory. You follow me, and I will bring victory. I will defeat my enemies. Because, you know, something amazing happened 2,000 years ago, right? From a cross, just outside Jerusalem. Or something amazing happened as three days later, Christ walked out of a tomb. Right? Something that changed everything before and after. Something that was, was laid from the foundations of the world. And there is absolute, undeniable Un, unopposable victory that God has accomplished through Jesus Christ. And 
there is nothing that you and I are facing that is not overcome through the cross and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that the problem will go away. Right? It doesn't necessarily mean, it can mean, but it doesn't necessarily mean the difficulty will go away. But in the midst of the difficulty, in the midst of the problem, there is absolute victory and triumph and overcoming in Jesus' name. Now, if it's a sin issue, it's dead on the cross. You and I have no excuse for bearing sin, right? For, for carrying our sin, for rebelling against God. We have no excuse. It has been 100% dealt with, and we participate in that victory through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. But does that mean that the physical ailment that I'm experiencing is going to be taken care of through faith in Jesus? Maybe, but maybe not. You know, does it mean that, you know, some financial strain that I'm facing is going to be taken away through faith if I just believe enough, or may the Lord forbid, give enough to the church, then man, God's going to bless me and he's going to take away all my financial burdens. Shut off the TV station, right, and tune into the word of God. Suffering can be very much a part of our experience here in this sin-sick fallen world, right? Suffering can be a part of that, but in the midst of the suffering, Jesus is glorified. In the midst of suffering, the enemy is defeated, Right? In the midst of your suffering, the enemy of your soul can be defeated. Praise God. Right? I mean, nobody wants to suffer, but that's a, that's a shout to Jesus time. Right? That if you are suffering, it doesn't somehow mean that God has separated you from himself or you don't have his blessing or you can't experience his triumph in the midst of it. In the midst of suffering, we can know him infinitely. Right? And eternally. We can taste of him in the midst of suffering in a way that people that have it easy or just smooth sailing have no idea who this God is. And so we celebrate him. Though the enemy can seem overwhelming, he brings victory. The scripture says, speaking of Ben-Hadad in verse 2, he sent messengers to the city to Ahab, king of Israel, and said to him, thus says Ben-Hadad. Now, in my New American Standard translation I'm used to, you see a lot of thus says the Lord. Thus says the Lord. Thus says the Lord all through the prophets in the Old Testament. Thus says the Lord. Well, here is the thus says Ben-Hadad. Immediately that goes within me like, man, who does he think he is, right? Well, I know who he thinks he is. It's the enemy speaking, right? And the enemy is, is getting our attention. When again, this enemy can take different forms, but the enemy cries out for our attention and says, thus says me, you will bow to my truth. Right? This enemy that stands against the knowledge of God, this enemy that contradicts surrender to Jesus Christ and finding life and life in him alone, this enemy that stands against everything that is holy will declare to you, thus says truth, bow to me. Think that's happening in America right now? You bet it is. You think that's hap happening in our, our uh, educational institutions? You bet it is. Think that's happening out of our, our news reports? Think that's happening out of even movements within our culture right now? You bet it is. There is an incredible power in, you know, we, we used to, I don't know if they still talk about this a lot, but man, I just wanted to throw up as a teenager every time I heard somebody talk about peer pressure. Peer pressure, peer pressure, peer pressure. I don't know if we still talk about that, but my goodness is there truth in peer pressure. And you and I as adults are not immune, right? The, the river is flowing in this direction, right? The river is flowing in this direction, the river of our culture. And for you to turn and swim upstream towards the truth of Jesus Christ is almost at times exhausting and agonizing, but you must fight the fight, right? You must swim upstream because it is a, it is a tidal wave heading in the wrong direction and it is swallowing up churches. It is. It's swallowing up churches to where we're going to beat our chests and shout real loud about what justice is. There is no justice apart from the justice of God. Right? How dare we, as the followers of Jesus Christ, get caught up in, in PC nonsense that has nothing to do with the cross of Christ. Apart from the cross of Christ, I can never know justice. I can never know peace. Why is the church of Jesus Christ getting swept up in these peripheral conversations when the core of it all is the human heart that needs redeemed and we're the only ones with the answer? Right? We're the only ones with the answer and huge evangelical ministries are getting on their soapboxes and preaching, right? Preaching against certain races and missing everything the gospel's about. 
right? Missing everything the gospel's about in the midst of it all. That there is one hope for the redemption of a human heart, and it rests in the cross of Jesus Christ. And in the cross of Jesus Christ, we then experience new life. And in that new life, new love and new hope and new peace and the ability to relate to another person in redemptive ways. Apart from that, man, I can espouse all kinds of catchy, cliche, PC nonsense that means nothing. But as we espouse it, even the church of Jesus Christ is feeling like, hey, you know, hey, look at me. I, I've got a voice that matters right now, too. And it sounds just like your voice, world. May Lord have mercy on our souls when we exit the gospel of Jesus Christ and carry another voice as the evangelical church. No one else is going to carry the gospel. I'm preaching to the choir. Forgive me. Holy cow. You can tell this stuff's been pent up for six months, right? We are... And I'm not speaking about we, right? But I'll, 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 I'll preach what I'm talking, I'll, I'll practice what I'm preaching. We, I'm a part of the church, right, in America. So I can repent on behalf of the church of America. We need to beg God for mercy for laying the gospel of Jesus Christ at the altar of secularization and taking up their gospel and promoting it. Right? Lord, have mercy on us and rescue us from ourselves. And it's, it just takes you back to 13 years old and wanting to fit in. I really think that's just about it. Well, and couple that with a dying relationship with Jesus Christ. Right? A, a, a separation from the intimacy with the Holy Spirit. Where we are grasping at a message that is not ours to carry. All right, we're called to carry the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Reconciliation with the Father through faith in him. That's the reconciliation. That's the message we carry. You know, loving all people created in the image of God. That is our message as God's people. the words of the famous prophet Yosemite Sam, great horny toads. What was that all about? Come on, you got to track with me on that one. Any Looney Tune fans when I was a kid? Great horny toads. <laughs> you feel me, Lon? You got to be feeling me, man. Come on. You back me up on these things. Well, let's get trucking here. Verse 2, then he sent messengers to the city of Ahab, king of Israel, and said to him, thus says Ben-Hadad, this word of the enemy, right? Your silver and gold are mine. Your most beautiful wives and children are also mine. The enemy will claim ownership over all you have and all that is precious to you. Right? Thus says the enemy, we own you. Right? Thus says the enemy, everything you own will submit to me. Thus says the enemy, everything you hold dear, and immediately I think of my wife and children, will submit to me. Thus says the enemy. The king of Israel replied, now listen to this. Now again, Ahab, king of Israel, was no King David, right? He was a mess. Listen to his response, because many times, and it's really kind of what I'm describing with this happening in the evangelical church in some pockets. The king of Israel replied, verse 4, It is according to your word, my lord, O king, Ben-Hadad, the enemy of God's people. It is according to your word, my lord, O king, I am yours and all that I have. That is happening, church. These ideologies that are anti-Christ, let alone anti-American and everything else, anti-Christ, right? We nod and say, yes, what you say is right. I am yours and all I have. This is an incredible time we're living in. And, you know, we've talked about out of Hebrews that everything that can be shaken will be shaken. So what remains is of the kingdom of God that can never be shaken. Right? This is a shaking time. Now, I'm not one that says, hey, end times, all that kind of thing. We don't know the hour. We don't know the day. But this is undeniably a shaking time where we're seeing a shaking within the body of Christ, too, let alone what we're seeing in our cities and governments and all kinds of things, you know, tons of shaking going on. But this is a shaking time for the body of Christ, too, where I really believe there's a bit of a separation between the wheat and the chaff right now. Who will take up their cross and follow Jesus Christ? Or who will take up the anthem of the world? The 
king of Israel, it's according to your word, my lord, O king. Phew. Then the messengers returned and said, Thus says Ben-Hadad, Surely I sent to you, saying, You shall give me your silver and your gold and your wives and your children. About this time tomorrow I will send my servants to you, and they will search your house and the houses of your servants, and whatever is desirable in your eyes they will take in their hand and carry away. You hear what the enemy is saying. Not even what, what we think, what the enemy thinks is valuable, he's going to take. No, no, what you think is valuable, he's going to take. What an incredible, like, insulting uh, threat, right? Just degrading threat. And you see how it goes. When a Christ follower acquiesces or begins to bow the knee to something that is anti-Christ, do you think that enemy is going to stop? You know? And we've seen this sometimes, right, play out in the church and played out in our politics and things where you see the acquiescence to something that is ungodly in the hopes of just kind of keeping some peace, right? Let's just keep some peace. And so we, we bend, we, we break the commandment of God, right, in our, in our alliances with another, whatever it may be. And what does the enemy do? Say, hey, you know, I said that thing, but tomorrow I'm going to come and take everything that you think is precious. The enemy will try to take everything from you. Verse 7, Then the king of Israel called all the elders of the land and said, Please observe and see how this man is looking for trouble. Hey, I, I tried to say yes, yes, and, and keep some peace, but now it's, even, it's going too far now, you know. For he sent to me uh, for my wives, my children, my silver, my gold, and I did not refuse him. And the elders and all the people said to him, Do not listen or consent. You cannot bargain with the enemy. You can't bargain with the enemy. And sometimes the enemy is exalted self. And that gets tricky, right? When self is telling you some things, right? Because self is trying to preserve self. When God has commanded us to take that self right to the cross and let it die with Christ on the cross so that we can truly live. That the life we live, Galatians 2.20, right? The life we live in the body would be lived by faith in the Son of God who loved us and gave himself up for us. You know, I'm crucified with I don't live, but Christ lives in me. You can't bargain with the enemy. You can't bargain with temptation. You can't bargain with self. You can't bargain with sin. You can't bargain with these ungodly ideologies. Verse 9, so he said, he said to the messengers of Ben-Hadad, Tell my lord the king, all that you sent to your servant at the first I will do, but this thing I cannot do. The messengers departed and brought, word, and brought him word again. Ben-Hadad sent to the king of Israel, Ahab, and said, May the gods do to me and more also if the dust of Samaria will suffice for handfuls for all those people who follow me. Right? I'm an overwhelming enemy. Bow to me. The king of Israel replied, Tell him. It's the first thing I like that Ahab says. The king of Israel replied, Tell him. Tell the enemy, the king. Let not him who girds on his armor boast like him who takes it off. You know, don't brag like the fight's over when the fight hasn't begun. You know, amen, hallelujah. Ahab's getting ready to fight. Verse 12, then ben, when Ben-Hadad heard this message, he was drinking with the kings and the temporary shelters, and he said to his servants, station yourselves. So they stationed themselves against the city. Now behold, a prophet approached Ahab, the king of Israel, and said, thus says the Lord, have you seen all this great multitude? You know, God isn't denying it, right? He's actually wanting to point it out. You know, we can take great faith and confidence in this. God isn't saying, hey, you know, that, that stuff doesn't really exist. Those problems really aren't there. That ideology really isn't plaguing our culture. It's not really bringing down churches and people. It's really, it's really a non-issue. That's not what God's saying. He's saying, hey, have you seen the multitude? Seen how many my, my enemies are? See the numbers you're facing? You know, that's God, right? See how big this thing is? Behold, I will deliver them into your hand today, and you shall know that I am the Lord. God reveals himself in the defeat of his enemy. Right? God reveals himself in the defeat of his enemy. See how many they are. See how strong the spiritual power is. Look at the weakness of yourself. This is about me, God is saying. All right, this is about me. Ahab said, by whom? You know, he said, you're gonna, I'm going to bring them into your hand today. Ahab in verse 14 says, by whom? Who are they going to be delivered into their hands by? 
Thus says the Lord, by the young men and the rulers of the provinces. Then he said, whom shall the battle begin? God answered, you. <laughs> right? And that's the truth for us too sometimes, isn't it? You know, okay, God, you're going to do this victory. You're going to work this out. You're going to cause the graves to be gardens. You're going to turn the, the morning into dancing. You're going to make the sea and highway, uh, highway in the sea. Lord, you're going to do these things. How's it going to happen? Well, I'm going to use you. I'm not so convinced anymore, Lord, you know, right? But why does he want to use you? And why does he want to use me? Because without him, we're helpless, right? We should know it. And certainly everybody else knows it. Right? Without him, we're helpless. And so he gets to, to show the triumph of who he is, the glory of who he is through us as his vessels in our brokenness, in our ineptitude, in our, in our total lack and deficiency. God fills up everything to overflowing and works in powerful and beautiful ways. Then he mustered the young men of the rulers, verse 15, in the provinces. There were 232, and after them he mustered all the people, even the sons of all Israel. There were 7,000. So we, we see we participate in God's victory through faith and obedience. And I really got to get cruising here. Um, you see there's 232 leaders, 7,000 Israelites. We know from a little bit later on there's 127,000 in the army of the Arameans. Like this isn't fair, right? This is completely outnumbered. But yet we get to participate in the victory of God against our enemies through faith and obedience, right? They believed and they responded. They did what he said to do. Verse 16, they went out at noon when Ben-Hadad was drinking himself drunk. So the, the, the enemy was drinking himself drunk at noon. That's good. In the temporary shelters with the 32 kings who helped him, the young men of the rulers of the provinces went out first and Ben-Hadad sent out and it was told them saying, men have come out from uh, Samaria. He said, if they've come out for peace, take them alive. If they've come out for war, take them alive. He didn't care if they were for them or against them, if they were battling against him or surrendering to him. The enemy, whether they fight or surrender, I will rule over them, he says. Right? Whether you put up a fight against the enemy, he says, or whether you surrender, he will rule over your life, is what the enemy thinks. Right? So these went out from the city, verse 19, the young men of the rulers of the provinces and the army which followed them. They killed each his man and the Arameans fled and Israel pursued them. And Ben-Hadad, king of Aram, escaped on horse with horsemen. The king of Israel went out and struck the horses and chariots and killed the Arameans with a great slaughter. Uh, then a prophet came near to the king of Israel and said to him, go, strengthen yourself, observe and see what you have to do. For at the turn of the year, the king of Aram will come up against you. Okay, so there was a defeat, right? There was a glorious victory. And what does the prophet say? Hey, go prepare yourself, recover, regroup, because it's coming again. You know, the battle against the enemy may repeat itself. Anybody ever experienced that in this life? That you have victory, but the battle may repeat itself. And you believe and walk forward for victory again. Now the servants of the king of Aram said to him, their gods are the god of the mountains. Therefore, they were stronger than we. But and he's talking about the people of Israel, right? The one true God. They're stronger than we, but rather let us fight against them in the plain, in the valley, and surely we will be stronger than they. Do this thing. Remove the kings each from his place and put captains in their place. Muster an army like the army you just lost, horse for horse, chariot for chariot. Then we will fight against them in the plain, in the valley, and surely we will be stronger than they. And he listened to their voice, and they did so. At the turn of the year, Ben-Hadad mustered the Arameans and went up to Aphek to fight against Israel. The sons of Israel were mustered and provisioned and went out to meet them. And the sons of Israel camped before them like two little flocks of goats, but the Arameans filled the country. Then a man of God came near, verse 28, and spoke to the king of Israel and says, Thus says the Lord. Because the Arameans, the enemies of God that stand against him, against his will, against his kingdom. Because they have said, the Lord is the God of the mountains, but he is not the God of the valleys. Therefore, I will give all this great multitude into your hand and show you that I am the Lord. Right? What, what was the enemy's take? God's strong here, but in this area, man, he's nowhere to be found. Right? Sure, in this area, God can, God can show up, but man, in this arena... He doesn't belong, right? In church, it's okay to mention God, but not in school, right? In church, it's okay to, to be a fanatic for Jesus. Man, not in politics, right? Not in public life, right? Not in family life, 
Not in the workplace. You know, it's one application, but also, man, the mountains and the valleys, right? Everywhere we go, everywhere we find ourselves, no matter what the day holds, God holds the day, right? He's the ruler. He's the Almighty. He's Lord of all things. So they camped one over the other, verse 29. And on the seventh day, the battle was joined, and the sons of Israel killed the Arameans, 100,000 foot soldiers in one day. But the rest fled to Aphek into the city, and the wall fell on 27,000 men who were left. Now, I don't know what kind of wall this was, but God must have gone, right? And Ben-Hadad fled and came to the city into the inner chamber. And there's more to the story, but we're going to stop there for our purposes today. He is the God of the mountains and the valleys. He's the God of the highs. He's the God of the lows. He's the God in the church. He's the God in your home. He's the God in the community. He's God in your workplace. He's God in the midst of a nation that is experiencing incredible unrest, right? He's God in the midst of a world that's starving. He's God. He's God, and we can trust him. He's God, and he has power. He's God, and he moves amongst the lives of people. He's God, and there's no one like him. I'm going to close this morning with Psalm 145 as we prepare our hearts for communion. Your Lord is an everlasting kingdom. Your dominion endures throughout all generations. The Lord sustains all who fall and raises up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you, speaking of the Lord, and you give them food in due time. You open your hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and kind in all his deeds. The Lord is near to all who call upon him, to all who call upon him in truth. Hallelujah. He's the God who turns mourning into dancing. Gives us beauty in a place of ashes. He brings out of shame his glory and forgiveness and righteousness. He's the one that turns those graves, those dead places, into gardens, into places of new life and beauty. He's the one who, who causes the dry bones to be an army. Mm. He's the one who makes a, a highway in the midst of the sea that is insurmountable, impassable. He's our God. He's the only one who can. Let's pray together. Lord, you're the only one. You're the only one who can, God. So you're the only one we trust. The only one we look to. Therefore, Lord, you're the only one we need. We're not going to get these things met in other people. We're not going to get these questions answered in the evening news or online. You're the only one. We cry out to you to turn these graves into gardens. Lord, bring life to dead places within our lives. Lord, the enemy has been shouting and shouting and shouting. And sometimes there's that temptation when something is said enough, we begin to bow to it. We begin to believe it. We begin to yield to it, God. Rescue us from lies. Rescue us from the, the hellish tongue of the devil and those that speak on his behalf. Rescue us, Lord. Sanctify us in truth. Your word is truth, as you say in the scripture. We love you and trust you. Look to you and long for you. God, as we, as we receive the bread representing your body and the juice representing your blood in just a few moments, Lord, we repent. We repent of our own sin, Lord. We repent of the sin of the church. Lord, for sitting idly by, for adopting messages that are not your message. Lord, for sometimes separating ourselves from people who are not like us. Lord, we long for that day when we see every tribe and every tongue, every nation, every people gathered at your throne, crying out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. May heaven and earth be filled with your glory. Oh, we thank you, God, and praise you. So cleanse our hearts, Lord. We look to you and trust you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you take the, the elements, find some around you if you haven't yet. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23, the scripture says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread, giving thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, after supper, he took the cup. 
saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. If you peel the thin plastic layer to access the wafer, the bread represents the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, broken for you and broken for me. Let us take and eat in remembrance of our precious Lord and Savior. Lord, we ask you to have your way among us. Have your way in my heart, Lord. Fill us with your spirit. Forgive us for times that we have been careless about your word, careless about connection with you in prayer, careless about connection with your body, careless about connection with unbelievers to lead them to saving faith in you by your Holy Spirit. Forgive us, God. Forgive us, Lord, when things that have been ugly, angry, or things that contradict your spirit have flowed from us online or on the phone or person to person. Forgive us, Lord. Our hearts are broken before you, God. Cleanse us and make us whole. You're the only one who can. You're the only one who can, God. The juice represents the blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Won't you take and drink in remembrance of Jesus? Stand with me. He's the only one who can. Where does the where's the grave that needs to turn into a garden? You know, where's the sea that needs to be made a highway? You know, where's the morning that needs to turn to dancing? He's the only one who can. And remember. Sometimes the dancing needs to turn to mourning before mourning can turn to dancing. As we rightly position our hearts before God in brokenness, then we can know the joy of the Lord as we surrender to him. I'd like to encourage you to, to consider, if you haven't started yet, spending these nine days from today on in prayer and fasting in a special way for the nation, for the world, for revival and repentance need a prayer guide, a little devotional guide, they're out at the desk on your way out. May we seek his face. And he promises you, he'll be found by you when you seek him, when you search for him with all your heart. Search for him with all your heart. Find the Lord in amazing ways and, and share him with everybody you come in contact with. May everybody through your life this week be confronted with the reality of the living God who was and is and is to come. To the glory of his name.